Thank you very much for being with us uh, this evening. This is very informal. Please help yourself to uh, wine, cider, cheese, crackers, grapes. I'm Rod Howe. I'm the executive director here at the History Center in Tompkins County. And I'm really delighted uh, that the History Center is hosting the Poetry in Place, honoring past and present local poet laureates through readings. And I think that I reached out to Jack soon after I started. I started in March. I think soon after that, I saw that Jack was the poet laureate, and um, we started a conversation, and Jack really put this together. So thank you very much, Jack Hopper, for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, I, I love anything that has the word place in it. I just feel that we live in such a unique place. Uh, we have lots of uh, way, reasons to be passionate about this place. So I'm glad that it's called Poetry in Place. So I try to carry a poetic sense around um, me. So I need help though. So the words we often use to talk about the History Center are that we're a place to know, discover, engage, and connect. So if any of you wanted to do a poem about knowing, discovering, engaging, and connecting through the History Center, please let me know. We'll be happy to work with you on that. The other poetic sense I have is, I, I don't know how many have actually been uh, to our archives. It's behind this wall. Has anyone seen the behind the scenes tour of our archives? So sometimes I imagine walking through there and having voices cry out to me like, take me, take me off the shelf and study me, research me. So we have all this material about people and buildings and places. And I'm always hoping that so many will come in and are doing research that will want that particular thing. So so see, so I'm trying. I'm trying to set the stage here for poetry. Um, but I also need help uh, because one of the things I think it's hard to be poetic about is asking for money. So, you know, we always have these strategic little boxes where people can drop money after an event. So if you have ideas on how I can be poetic about asking for money, I'm open to suggestions for that as well. Uh, if any of you don't get our electronic newsletter, it's called History Happenings. Make sure you see Caleb and sign up together. It goes out once a month, but it's a way of keeping posted on everything that we're doing. So again, thank you for being here this evening, and I'm turning it over to Jack Hopper. Again, Jack, thank you very much for joining this evening. By the way, we are videotaping this, um, so I don't think that matters to anyone out there, and I think you all knew that anyway. Okay. Well, thank you. Dare say I had something to do. My mother's a writer, 
with Anna Singer, with me, uh, Pursuit of the Arts. Narrowsburg, New York. I grew up in the log cabin my father built, where the land slowed down and tree frogs built strange music, where my father tilled potatoes, planted rhubarb, and my mother killed snakes, where I sang to salamanders that lived beneath my window and watched thunderstorms unafraid. The cabin was made of knotty pine wood that glowed, my father's rifles on one wall, my mother's carved glass mirror on another, and a crystal chandelier hanging between them. This is the cabin where my mother sat for hours, listening to jazz, singing to Aretha, bumming through catalogs and dreaming. I'd see her bend the pages back, marking time, and she'd show me things that she wanted to buy for my room, and talk about tearing out walls to make space for rooms my father never allowed. My room was a closet of space that suffocated when Daddy refused to wear his hearing aids, and the television screen behind my head, Mork and Mindy, nado nado over and over again. So many nights I fell asleep like this, in a butterfly of yellow curtains, imaginary places where I lay dreaming, just like my mother. This next piece is called My Father Prepared Me. I want to thank Poet Laureate J. Ewing for helping me with the ending. He wrote a story about this in the Ithaca Journal and it was published there and then excerpted later in Fresher and a number of anthologies. And I'm proud to say this is a piece that took 10 years and I finally learned how to end it. <laughs> mm, say thanks to Jay. How My Father Prepared Me. When I was 11, my father felt I needed some sort of coming of age experience. Two years shy of the age for a bat mitzvah and not Jewish, my father came up with something so original no black girl I knew had ever experienced it. He took me ice fishing. On a day so cold and hurt, his voice drowns out my mother's protest. She's black, Ma. She may as well work suffering. Trees bearded with ice, the smoke sky, and everywhere the sound of falling. As the truck rattled the ice rods, spinning wheels and compasses. In the hitch, blankets, buckets, and two dozen crappy minnows in the rusted bed tin. My father, seated like a Buddha, adjusts the bucket, drills the holes, and pitches forward. God damn it! He laughs. It's cold. But how long can you sit on a bucket? Watching the white-skinned evergreens, the hook-eyed doe skittering, and the downy sun blindness? In the end, ice fishing is an act of desperation. Many years before he died, my father fell through the ice, kicked his way back to memory, came home rude and withered, refusing to talk. Now the orange flag bolts up, the bass thrashes, we tug and grip the line, the stakes heave, fluorescent rods strike the sky, we win! Meaning, the bass got tired of all the ridiculous flailing and jerking and just heaved itself out of the water and just gave in. <laughs> More annoyed than startled, its dark eye pulsed, its mouth opened and closed, my own mouth opened and closed. Teddy, can we save it? Why can't we save it? Why can't we just toss it back in? Don't cry, my father said. Everything dies. This poem is from Oxford American Magazine. It's called Cane. Grandma Annie always brought the cane down with one swift lash, a cutting stroke so perfect even white folks had to go on and praise her. She worked the fields from the first hint of daylight, her long body stronger than the plow animal in front of her. The blue flowered dress hitched up beyond what was considered appropriate. Shoot, she'd say. It's too hot to be formal. Sometimes she'd turn her dark brown face up to the sweltering sky talking to God, her mouth full of praises but scant of wishes, dreams. And when she was done praying, my grandpa James would slide up alongside her, pat her on the backside a few times here and there as the day drew down and say real fly in her ear. Strong like an ox, I reckon. She'd snort and brush past and her pace quickening, her mind anticipating that favorite time of day, dusk. When a slight breeze came over you and your eyes strained to remember the last row you were on, then all at once it was night. A time rich with blessings, like having your own thoughts to think of. Uh, and the collards meet, 
and sat back on the stove, the thick crust of cornbread dabbed greasy with butter, the oil lamp burnishing the room, the empty pie plates in the sink, the girls splashing, the sounds of tin and water, the tumbling into bed, their sure breathing, the chorus rocks tick ticking and the rocking chair creaking. Grandma Annie adjusts the sewing in her lap, the needle in one hand, the stitching so straight and certain you'd swear a machine had gone and done it. Sometimes Grandpa would sit next beside her in his drawers, shirtless. She'd look up from her sewing and smile just a little bit and then take a sip of whiskey. She'd take in the golden skin, the wavy hair under his arms, the promise of what was between his thighs. Maybe it was the cane stiffness, its toughness even in the breaking that she admired. It sure wasn't the cotton, its intolerable whiteness, the insufferable bones. But tonight, she wasn't in the mood to remember things that pained her. Tonight, she was in the mood for her husband, who puts his drink down, leans over and then boils the heavy braids from her head and pulls her up. She spits a little stuff into the sink, takes a sip of honey water and heads to bed. Naked, she licks the palm of his, his I'm sorry, naked, she licks his palm, that Bible of the body, her pulse in her throat, the sweat tastes like sugar, I always get a little embarrassed imagining my grandparents' sex life, but I thought grandparents have sex, so I will write it and do it, but then I get all nervous thinking that no, she please in the afterlife. And uh, these last uh, two pieces are from a new manuscript I've written. I've never write something and notice like the same image keeps appearing, and then you think, oh, is that what I'm interested in? Who knew? So like every poem I wrote for a year had a frog in it. One day I was like, maybe the frogs have a story. So this is from the new manuscript called Necessary Offerings in the Land of the Frog King. Small offerings. Toads, I once thought, spoke to no one in particular. Nor did I believe that there was a big, wise, elder toad offering kind counsel somewhere to the dull, short human as it drifted by in its lily pad of thatch and swamp root. That was, of course, until I heard a gaggle of them humming in the rain spout runoff low beneath the basement window on the rainiest of days. Some were as tiny and moon-shaped as my fingernail. The others, half the size of my seven-year-old hand, dropped off by their huge toad mothers and gigantic toad fathers who left them to their lovely leaping in the big amphibian playpen. The parents would spring off away to manage their very grown-up business of fly and rub hunting in the nearby woods. I cut the smallest, a gurgle of delight in my hands. Those were the ones I brought the best of the wood surprises to. The unhatched snail, tumbled back rosebud, and long silvery stick, just right for escaping the sudden rush of bladders or seeds. I lay upon the earth, my eyes closed to the sun, their toad speak soft in my ears. They told me far more than play and run, but I swore to keep it all to myself as I shared the small offerings of twigs and dead flies, how easily everything rolled from my tongue. And I, I'm going to be over time, so is that clear? Okay, one more. You know, when we get an audience as poets, if you've come out, we we're just amazed that you came out on this beautiful night because um, most people are outside, can't believe it's like 70 or 80. Uh, so this last piece is um, actually um, called The Carousel, and I'm exploring the concept of uh, Alzheimer's. The Carousel. At first it was the stuff, the small stuff everyone loses. Keys, sunglasses, umbrellas, then occasionally more, wallets, season tickets, the dog. He forgets more and more that he would consider important, imperative even, if he remembered it to be so. The first night he spent with her in Belize, to her dismay, then his utter shame, his brain refused to also remember the first night they made love or swam in the hotel pool or when he stood by the museum statue mocking its grin. Later, he will be unsure why he's driven to a McDonald's on the outskirts of town, a place he reviles, yet there he is under the bright, unhappy lights, unwrapping the small paper, biting into the burger, mustard on his chin. 
no twitch of the arms or legs to signal the falling asleep. It was rather like being suspended between two states, awake and alert. He remembers or thinks he remembers a movie he once loved. He can't recall its name, just the arc of a film about friends. Being out of order, maybe it was Memento or something like that. He feels as if he's in his own slideshow, one of those ancient Kodak carousels, not the ones from the musings of his musty childhood, where his paranoid mother insisted that each of the four kids unplug every single appliance in the house before tumbling into bed. She told him that's what every Jewish kid does. He didn't believe it true. But rather, he was thinking of the carousel. The carousel, not the regular carousel, but the carousel episode of Mad Men, where the wheel is a device of nostalgia that affords viewers a chance to zoom through memories as a child, around and around, and back home again. To operate the wheel properly, the slide must go in backwards and upside down to reflect the image or the object of interest in its upright position. He imagines himself <coughs> turned upside down, turning around towards something akin, resembling memory. He hopes to hold the four slides that will remain permanently affixed, just these. Wintry white veil, sun's birth, red wheelbarrow, his father casting the line where the certainty of each and every four, the four clicks will make him feel, even if wrongly, that just those four memories will last forever. Thank you. Jack, are you going to say a little bit about each of the talks? I just invited them to. OK, good. All right. So Michelle, maybe? Before, because some people don't know, maybe some of your background, would you mind? Oh, sh sure. Before I was the laureate, I did not have the English accent. <laughs> so, as I, said, as I said earlier, it was the second poet laureate of Tompkins County. I've been a poetry fellow at many numerous prestigious poetry residencies. My work has been in leading journals and magazines. I'm the author of the poetry chapter of the month, excuse me, the month of not speaking and breathe, an artistic retrospective and memoir. My poems have been commissioned by museums and business schools, and I perform nationally and internationally in Africa and Canada in coffee houses with years on the slam tour circuit years ago, and parks, stadiums, prisons, colleges, and elsewhere. And I would be happy to write a poem for this to have at the History Center, but I am commissioned these days. All right, thank you. <laughs>
the assassination of Kennedy accomplished by Merlin, the hydrogen bomb invented by the Mayans of Germany. And whose story is it you're going to believe? And what dream of fact is this from which you have yet to awake? And where do you come from, O oh, thread in history's rug? O oh, water drop far from the sea, O oh, man or woman kept and caught, imprisoned in a story written by others, wandering through someone else's dream of the world. I took a uh, rowing mare badge on Cuba Lake, and uh, I got this poem out of it. Uh, it's called Rowboat. An oar is a paddle with a home. This arrangement seems awkward at first, as if it were wrong. The wood knocks in the oar lock. We would much rather be a church steeple or the propeller of an old airplane in France. Yet, as it bites deep into the wave, it settles down, deciding that the axe and the carpenter were right. And you, too, are supposed to be sitting this way, back turned to what you want, watching your history unravel across the waves as your legs brush against the gunwales. Your feet are restless, wanting to be more involved, but your back is what gets you there, closer to what finally surprises you from behind, waves lapping at the shore, the soft nuzzle of sand. There's a local poem. Uh, this is about uh, Green Star uh, Co-op, uh, where I have an occasion to work uh, now and then. Uh, like a lot of things in our culture these days, it's a pretty cool place, but it's also something deeply horrible about it. It's for the same time. Uh, it's called another shift in the supermarket of perpetual desire. Work is the bright box by the highway, the glad, gruesome chamber of rainbow chard and chocolate, where dollars are translated to apples and credit card numbers become ice cream. It is continual harvest, and when this one expires, we get another from California or greenhouses in Jersey, even the hillside farmlands of Ecuador. I am the front desker, chief welcomer and disentangler of faulty returns, as shoppers wander the store like bees and nuzzling for nectar. Skull deep in the buzz, I babysit freezers as cash registers ping and coins clatter and 80s rock babbles in the speakers overhead. Customers give money and we give eggs and bags of organic raisins, but the giving is a little whisper under the exhalations of the beer cooler and the needs running like fires through the dry grasses of the blood. Generosity. That old man who called to wonder how you cook brown rice. That Japanese exchange student who came in lost looking for the bus. If all the food could be heaped in a field, there were another answer to the question of hunger, a carnival in the jungle, or an apple crammed yurt in a kingdom of horses and flags. At the desk, I'm one with the world, gainfully occupied in hearing testimony and accepting confessions of husband bought wrong thing and can't eat this. <laughs> I speak in numbers and truck with accountable as somewhere outside day and moon and cloud. Telephone is the snake in the garden, the crack in the gladness. I answer to voices asking, do you have, and how much, and will you? I will, and later my paycheck becomes olive oil and walnuts from aisle three, for I too am a customer, an almond-loving mammal with a name tag bobbling against my chest, and cravings live in me like flames in a paper bag. Hunger may be a kind of wisdom, but all the same at midnight I mix the music, set the alarm, lock the doors, and walk home across the empty parking lot leaving presidents motionless on the bills and the tills in the store behind me to sink all the jumble with dirty plastic cups, bananas in their boxes, slowly right. And here's a little mother goose for you. Uh, this is a poem called Hey Diddle Diddle. Hey Diddle Diddle, you know, all three the source first, you know the original, you can do it in the chorus probably. Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat that fell, the cow jumped over the Little dogs laugh to see such fun, and the dish ran away with the spoon. Oh, thank you. That's the start of all poetry, perhaps. So this is a little four-part uh, expansion of that. Claws scrambling up the fingerboard, whiskers on chin rest, a caterwaul of melody agreeing to fill and fill the greedy air with sharps like burrs in a sweater and flats like skippering gray stones. Midsummer night and this mad cat just sawing away. Tail thumping to the rhythm, first idle, then intent, angry like the tail itself is going to run off and toss pots through windows. 
And all the while, this melody on top, like a fern uncurling, a green arabesque finding its shape where none had been before, called a divertimento, a reel, some tawny etude cast all the way back to the scratchless past when every yowl was just a purr. Afterwards, the lush hush of evening, stars set on the sky's table, and one stray bow hair drifting into the ground. So this porcelain-colored bovine, splotchy with muted browns and whites, like water stains on maps, springs clean as a gear loose from a clock up, out and over, with a big white ancient seen-it-all rock hanging there, like a drop of paint over her udder and hooves and dangling tail, the moon. And what ratio of body mass to velocity? What alignment of muscle tone and angle of ascent? What do-kissed manual of barnyard aeronautical maneuvers is it? to which this stunt is proof. A hop, a jump, a startled moo curdling the air. She came to ground soon after. Now the laughing dog. I'd never heard a dog laugh. Not sure I did then, but there was a bark, surely. Then another, then a sound like four or five of them heaped up on top of one another. Ruff stepped on Ruff, or was it Woof, a warble? Did he cough because he wanted to sing? Could you call it a laugh, a sneeze, some mistake in the face all dogs present to humans? A gladsome glitch in the ancient subservience? Done up. I turned to look, but he just sat there. Circular is a voyage that comes back to its start, officer. Round as a wheel of extra sharp cheddar, and about yay big. That's what my dish looked like. And no, I didn't see them go. Didn't catch sight of their escape or elopement, or whatever it is you want to call it, though I was there, sure, in the next room, just sitting down to french fries and a cold beer, when there came this clatter amid the kitchenware, a ruckus near the cabinetry, and then the door banging in what, I see now, was unintended farewell, because look, there's a bare place in my cupboard, seven plates where once there were eight, and in the drawer I've got a fork, knife, and, oh, most edgeless one, most innocent and least weapon-like, funhouse friendly, though, I gotta say, always a trifle warped. Nothing but an empty place where the spoon once sat. Such a perfect system 
the dream in the palace water that my faith didn't alter. He strapped them carefully on and led me to the mega room. We climbed to the roof edge and I waited, wax pledged for the wind to carry me, soaring like an eagle, effortlessly, to the chariot Helios drives each day across the sky. And suddenly I was lifted up into the terrible blue lap of the gods, an odorless ether, freed of every earthly fetter. I unstrapped my heart preferring death on earth to wings. Um, this one is called myth. In myth, everything is possible. Matricide, self-mutilation, children served up to the father for dinner, bodies torn apart by dogs or crazed women, husbands murdered in the bath. Dramas were set in the safe past, horrors kept off stage. Myths were warnings of what might happen if grief got loose, if each death was answered by another. These days, the grief-stricken take the stairs to the terrace. They hold hands. Perhaps they kiss for a last time. Then they jump. They don't expect a god to intervene. If he hasn't already, as their life diminished day by day, there's small chance he'll open a parachute above their heads before the hot concrete rises to meet them. During the German occupation, a car collected bodies each morning. Now an ambulance picks up the fallen, the son and the mother he can't afford to keep, a father with an infant under each arm. No monument marks the spot. They fell not in war, but despair, not for their country, because of it. It's hard to keep the horror off stage. <coughs> Um, a month ago, I was in Athens <coughs> visiting one of Greece's most famous poets, Katharina Angela Giroux, and um, she uh, is still, I'm glad to say, writing poetry, but as the poet, poet, poem will explain, um, there is some diminishment of her life. It's called <coughs> Poets Meet in the Sad Sea. Outside the window, the walls dissolve in a wash of graffiti. The city sinks under a burden too heavy to bear. The poet grapples to translate a word. Her mind an orderly room where words are shelved by sound and sense. Like the Acropolis, this faculty endures. Around her, a scaffolding of neatness shores memory up. She seldom ventures into the streets. Her tidiness takes me by surprise. Chaos became her, dishes piled in the sink, surreptitious rinsing of a glass before we drank, piles of paper shunted to make room for a bottle. Nothing distracted from a poem but this accommodation for a friend, the raised glass. A Romanian woman cares for her, brushes her hair, bobby pins it flat, brings cold Nescafe on a plastic tray. called Palmyra. I seem to be not following the other poets in having any humor in these poems. I seem to be pretty grim. I'm trying to finish with something a little more cheerful, but not this one. Um, I don't think anything cheerful is going on in Palmyra. Poised between Persia and Rome, the caravan city grew rich trading in silk. Citizens spent their silver coins in its public baths and Roman theater, built handsome sandstone temples that glowed gold in the desert sun. In the Syrian scheme, the bald ibis is a small thing. It was thought extinct until seven birds were found nesting near, near Palmyra. Then there were four, then only one. They called her Zenobia for the queen who ruled this city in its heyday. The city is now in hands of men ready to destroy it. A reward is offered to anyone knowing the whereabouts of Zenobia, sole survivor of the tiny colony of all Ibis who lived at Palmyra, a small thing in the Syrian scheme. And I'll uh, read, uh, just to finish a, a couple of short poems from another piece of confession, which is the last, um, book I published, 
and which is bilingual. Uh, it has poems in English and Greek. And some of them I translated myself, and then I had the good sense to ask some very good Greek poets to translate the rest. Um, in it, it, it looks at Penelope's view of the Trojan War. And this one's called Penelope Contemplates Infidelity. Memory has become ethereal, she thinks, sitting on the waterfront, rain dripping from the awnings of the cafes where the tourists cluster to eat ice cream at tables. She sips her ouzo slowly, gazes at the unforgiving sea, wonders how she became a symbol of fidelity. Some poet's fault, no doubt. Penelope sips and waits. Memory once had a bouquet. Now it needs flavoring like the milky liquor in her glass. To what then is she faithful? Memory to steal the spirit? Yet that old hippie with a broken sandal was the first who dared. Last night, pretending to drop a spoon, he bent and kissed her knee under the paper tablecloth. Someone is playing a bouzouki, singing a rabbinical song. The stranger comes limping smelling slightly of salt. Incarnate memory takes her by the hand, leads her to the house. Strange how the dog wags its tail, as if it too is tired of waking. Thank you. I started writing in my in my twenties. I stopped abruptly in my in my early thirties, and I never thought I would write again. But I started writing again after this horrific heart surgery that I that I um, survived in 2009, in which I literally died, and I came back with poems, which was totally remarkable to me. I had no expectation that I was going to write again. At any rate, I, I started writing, and um, I started showing them to people. And people told me to publish them. So I, I have a chapbook published. This is all about the heart surgery. Uh, it was published by Permission Line Press. It's available in my most three books. I'm not going to read from that tonight. Um, I'm going to read from my current book, Afterlife, which is about my past and about history and, and, and so on. But before I read, um, I, I was given a poem by Catherine Helen Mahan, who cannot be here tonight. Uh, she was the first poet laureate, and she's a professor at Ithaca College. She is, she is published numerous chapbooks and collections of poetry. And I will uh, read this poem of hers for you tonight. It's called Wanting Silence. Fox walks as slowly as she can where pine needles soften a raw earth trail. Toe to heel, toe to heel, the way her father taught her when she knew he was king of the world. She doesn't want to write a sonnet. She doesn't want new words at all, but just to touch rough moss and roots and find the orange mushrooms growing where a black branch fell and stayed. There, a single lady slipper pale as purple and rounded fragile blossom on a slender stalk. Quiet. Fox thinks alone and simple in a world forced by machines. No one is allowed to touch it. So few know it's rare and frail. A blossom far from noise and uproar. A talisman, a grail. So that was that was Catherine's poem that she wanted us to pass along to you. Thank you so much for hosting this too, and thank you, Jeff, for, for inviting us on. Um, I will read a few poems from my second collection, as I said. Um, I, I was brought up on the Southern California coast, and I, I started thinking about my childhood when we drive home at night. And, and so this poem is, is, is from that time. 
the drive home. We would meet the night with simplicity, slipping into half-sleep by the roar of the car engine, carrying us into the late hour, city lights twinkling and dissolving, and then the blackness and moon shimmering on the sea. We traced the miles to home with the radio purring weather reports, news, and rock music. Jarred awake when the engine died, signaling arrival. The foggy sea air whispers the clicking of keys and of lights. A day banished, prayer. Now I lay me down. Childhood is half awake as it cries on the world. And the world is indifferent as it lures the child toward no known destination, deep sleep, the long night. Um, like Gail, a lot of my poems are very serious. Um, this next one is about my mother. She, she was an alcoholic. She died of lung cancer at the age of 59. She was brought up in, in Southern California and went to Hollywood High School. And we used to talk about how she dreamed of being a singer, and of course that never, never came to fruition. She, ended up marrying and having kids right away. This is called Memories in Blue. I send my mind into the past and find my mother sitting alone on the couch, drink in hand, humming into the silence. What was she longing for? Not much time left then. Fingers tapping, her pain still visible in the distance. The voices of children perhaps awakened some other moment in her. When she was a child, once dreaming, a young woman holding her own child. My mother is in shadow. She is bigger than life in her longing and her singing and her loneliness. I send my mind into the past and find her in the Hollywood High School yearbook, saying she'll go into radio singing in the future. But she meets another path. Another life grabs her right there as she passes. Now I see her smile, see her curled into her corner on the worn burgundy couch, singing Judy Garland songs late at night while her children slept, dreaming of her, so far away, singing into the emptiness, as if the emptiness were listening. Uh, this next one, I, I started looking into my, my past. My mother was Dutch and Irish, so I started looking into my mother's side and, and found all these relatives in the Netherlands. And, you know, and so, so I wrote this poem about that, imagining what it was like for them to come to this land. This is good for the History Center. It's called In the Distance. I sense a homesickness for a place hidden inside my marrow, a lighthouse with the eyes of my ancestors longing for a glimpse of landfall. I know I have wandered the lush fields of Ireland and felt the spray of the North Sea off the coast of the Netherlands on the lookout for a new world in a time that does not change. I am homesick for a place I never inhabited, on a pilgrimage deep inside the landscape of stillness. An age long past sleeps in me, ghosting my skin. So I, I will end with this. Um, this is a relatively new one. It's called Late Early Night. I, I'm somebody who wakes up at 5 in the morning and, and starts writing and thinking about the past and being, thinking about our lives. And, and so, that, you know, I'm, I'm middle-aged now, so I started thinking about time is running out. So this is called Late Early and, and I was grateful for still having time. This is called Late Early Light. I can almost sense the beginning like dust gathering on invisible air and creating a ghost-like radiance. I cannot see anyone clearly. I cannot taste the abundance of each hour given. My mind lives back near the shoreline. I am digging for treasure. I am asleep in the warm summer sun. I see our lives slipping out of each moment I see our growing up full speed ahead and yet lingering in the place where we are now vanished. Why would one want to live forever young, longing for so much from life? Delivered finally to a quiet dawn and late autumn, 
enough splendor to make the heart break and to drink in more just once more. Thank you. Summer squall, rain in September after much heat, 
A scrim of mist diffuses light. Hydrangeas past full bloom turn endless in an art nouveau chandelier. Our young cat darts from sill to windowsill on the front porch, stalking outdoor leaves, torn and flying like shipwrecked prey. He spies a squirrel, a bird. <coughs> His face takes on that set look I have seen men wear on the subways, watching the moon. This again is looking back to Manhattan, where I spent a lot of time before my tenure uh, stint up here, which is kind of a small version of Manhattan in its own ways. Before Roosevelt Island, 1964. Before its cable car, before its condos and crowds and swanky new name, there was this strip in the East River between Manhattan and Queens called Wards, later Welfare Island, where the dead outweighed the living, reinterred from the pauper's graves across East River, making room for the creation of Madison Square and Bryant Park, an early form of gentrification. Wards also claimed a lunatic asylum, and one for consumptives exiled there for air. All gradually abandoned like a deserted house open to break-ins by curious children when we importantly descend, hipsters out of that Manhattan's glory side, craving rustic green in this limo land. We settle, open beer, jug wine, past sandwiches, reefers. Sprawled in the overgrown grass, we dish those not there and each other. Discuss whether heart crane cribbed emblems of conduct from Samuel Greenberg, terminal poet of Wards, and how CK wines is way better than Gallo any day. Then on to invade the hospital, closed for some time, its doors lean open as if the inhabitants had fled like extras and a black and white movie never filmed. Leaving behind wheelchairs and wicker, windows stare down like cataract eyes through broken casements, empty corridors sprawl, Halls of records, x-rays scattered across the floor. TB, a wasted chillness, like plague, influenza, or yet to come, AIDS. We grow oppressed by the silence, by dust of this museum without doses, and even of each other. Only patient shadows, whose hosts have long departed, stand by to point to exits, to escape the air we fear infected, and return to odors of push carts, voices, right out loud, double touching on the asphalt of New York. Itself a constantly changing anachronism of asylums, graveyards, infectious disease, and public squares promoting picnics of impressionistic young people having a fine time roaming down by the riverside. This is a little more personal. Uh, I was about five years old when this happened in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I'm lucky to still be alive. You will understand when you hear this. Safe to see is the title. My mother put me on a makeshift raft, propelled us down the swollen creek, our goal a distant highway bridge, without considering how currents often stay one way. Along we floated till the shadow of that overpass darkened, and our fight to return began as mother plied the pole, now upstream against the flow. The wooden rafts long dead, and so is she, with mates of mine gone, too. And I'm alone, holding against the currents on my own craft. I have drifted down the river Alf, conversed with Mr. Kurtz, about the horrors of 100 years, may get back against the flood, I, and that, or, and am still unsure if I will ever make it back against the flood, or recognize our place of first departure, and who may be on shore, waiting in your home.
This is a poem that is really about a, about poets, about writing poetry, but it takes it from a different point of view. It's called Airy Lists. On a platform he gathers breath, grips the trapeze, beeps into air along a line visible only to him, dives like a swimmer over water, fathoms deep, and glides, glides to the other side, where his partner waits for the catch. The two of them swing Tarzanic under the circus dome, exchanging the bar, each other's hands, wrists, ankles, from platform through ether to platform, as the sighs of disbelief gather and rise, baited with fantasies of failure and fall. Of it all, pair soar in their couplets finale, embracing each other and the world.